And good morning again. Well, Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio joins us from Miami. And uh, Senator, I want to just start with a story that's been getting so much attention over these uh, past few days, and that is this mess that uh, New Jersey Governor uh, Chris Christie finds himself in. Uh, what is your reaction to this? Uh, do you think he's still a viable candidate if he decides he does want to seek the Republican presidential nomination? Well, first of all, good morning. Thank you for having me on, and, and Happy New Year to you and those that are watching. You know, I think it would be a mistake for me and others like me to comment on this. Uh, first of all, we don't know all the facts. I think this is a story that's still developing, and we should reserve judgment. And beyond that, I'm just not don't know that much about it other than what I've seen reported in the press. So I really don't have much to add other than that. Uh, and I wouldn't, you know, delve into the political speculation uh, as well. That, that would be a mistake. So, Have you, uh, have you uh, decided uh, one way or the other whether you're going to explore running for president? No, you know, interestingly enough, in 2016, I'm up for re-election if I want to choose to stay in the Senate. So I'll have to make a decision around this time next year about whether I'm interested in running for another office or running for re-election or becoming a private citizen. Well, Senator, uh, as you well know, uh, this month marks the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, declared, uh, declaring oh, war on poverty. On poverty. Uh, you made a big Money speech forward. where you laid out some proposals on alleviating uh, poverty this week, and I want to talk to you about the substance of those proposals. Yes. But first, I just want to ask you this. Uh, coming off an election... Uh, where the Republican candidate lost and polls suggest many people uh, say one of the reasons he did not do well is because he kind of wrote off uh, lower income people, uh, seemed indifferent to them. Uh, in light of that, uh, why was it good politics to go to the Lyndon Johnson room in the U.S. Capitol and uh, say that Lyndon Johnson's programs had been uh, a failure, his programs well, to alleviate poverty? Well, first of all, let me just say that I, I understand there's going to be a political analysis done of this issue. But for me, I've been talking about this now for the better part of a decade, going back to my service in the Florida legislature. And the reason is I myself am but a generation removed from poverty and despair. And the reason why I live a better life is because my parents had the opportunity to come to a place where people like them had the opportunity to improve their lives. I think that is still true for the majority of Americans, but I think it would be wrong not to recognize that there are a significant number of Americans that do not have equality of opportunity. That is not a political issue. That is something that threatens what makes us exceptional and different from the rest of the world. We need to address that. We need to address the fact that we have 40 some odd million people who feel trapped in poverty and do not feel like they have an equal opportunity to get ahead. And I don't view that as a partisan issue or an electoral one. I think it goes to the heart of what it means to be America. As far as the war on poverty is concerned, its programs have utility. They do help uh, alleviate the uh, consequences of poverty, but they don't help to people to emerge from that poverty. And that's why I feel like the war on poverty has failed, because it's incomplete. I think we have failed to take the next step, which is to help people trapped with inequality of opportunity to have the opportunities to build for themselves a better life. Well, and that's what I hope we'll be able to accomplish. Well, you are not saying that programs like Head Start were a failure, because I took that from your speech that that, that is what you were saying. Is that what you meant? Well, that's not what my speech said. Actually, I think programs like Head Start are, are, are geared in the right direction in the sense that they're trying to get children educational opportunities as young as possible. I think where those programs could be completed and improved is if we create flexibility in them at the local level. So I'm not saying we should dismantle the efforts. I'm saying that these efforts need to be reformed. And I believe the best way to reform them is to uh, turn the money and, and the influence over to the state and local level, where I think you'll find the kinds of innovations that allow us to confront an issue that's complex and, quite frankly, diverse. Well, For example, rural, rural poverty looks different than urban poverty, and there, there are different approaches to it. Well, that was one of the major proposals that you outlined, just turn these programs over to the states. But I'll tell you, the question I had uh, when I heard you say that is I know some of these states, when they had the opportunity, opted out of uh, federal programs like uh, Medicaid, especially some uh, where there were conservatives uh, like yourself uh, running the local governments. What if these states opt out of these programs? Then what happens to these children all, and these people yeah. in poverty? Well, here's the distinguishing factor under Obamacare. When you turn Medicaid over to the states, what you're saying to them is the money will be available up front for the expansion for a few years, and then the money will go away, but you get stuck with the unfunded liability. I'm not saying we should do that. I'm actually saying that what we should do is take the existing federal funding that we use for some of these programs, and we're still working through which ones those should be, 
collapse them into one central federal agency that would then transfer that money to fund innovative state programs that address the same issues. But it would be funded. It wouldn't be something where states are told, you get the money for a few years and then we'll back away. And it should be revenue neutral. Uh, uh, Senator, do you think there's any way that the uh, Congress uh, or even the Senate is going to come together and find a way uh, to extend these unemployment benefits? I know you're going to vote on it next week. What do you think yeah. the outlook there I, is? I do, I do think there's an outcome that we can arrive at. And I, if you look at it, I think there's a general consensus that these programs need to be extended. but. They need to be paid for, and in addition to that, maybe not as, as part of this effort right away, but in the long term, we need to figure out a way to reform those programs so that we get more people back to work. Let me uh, ask you about another big story. Uh, Bob Gates, the former Secretary of Defense, had a book out this week, and a lot of people were surprised. Uh, he had some pretty harsh things to say about Joe Biden, said he was wrong on most everything. Uh, a, a lot of people who have been around here for a while, like I have, were we're a little surprised to see uh, not so much what he said, but the fact that uh, Gates, who has always been the uh, you know the ideal, the person of, of ultimate discretion, what did you think about him making these disclosures? Yeah, I have two thoughts, Bob. The first is my preference would be that uh, people would refrain from writing these sorts of things until the president is out of office because I think it undermines the ability to conduct foreign policy. That being said, I don't think we can ignore what's in that book, and I think for many of us it confirms our worst fears and that is that this is an administration full of people that either have the wrong convictions or in the case of uh, former secretary clinton lack the courage of her convictions uh, you see that for example the motivations in afghanistan was primarily political and the idea the president had that this was not his war and you saw that reflected in the decision that he made at the same time that he announced the surge he also announced an exit date and strategy thereby emboldening the Taliban to believe they could wait us out. And the result is now evident across the globe. Our allies see us as unreliable, and our enemies feel emboldened. And I, I think that th this is, confirms our worst fears, that this is an administration that lacks a strategic foreign policy, and in fact is largely driven by politics and tactics. What happens now in Iraq? It looks like it may fall back into the hands of the rebels. Has this war going to turn out to be a, a tragic waste? Well, first of all, we need to understand that much of what's happened in Iraq lately has been the result of poor leadership within Iraq. I, I think contributing to that is the fact that the U.S. does not have a long-term status in Iraq. Uh, as a result, you know, Iraq airspace is used by Iranians and others to do all sorts of things. Ultimately, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq, the future of those countries is in the hands of their own people. And the U.S. can't rescue them from themselves. But I do think we have a strategic interest in what happens there. And, uh, and it poses a real challenge. Because if you start adding it up now, Bob, you have an ungoverned space in Iraq, ungoverned spaces in Syria, potentially ungoverned spaces if Afghanistan begins to fall back, ungoverned spaces in, in Africa. This is all fertile territory for al-Qaeda and other radical elements to set up training camps and plot attacks against the homeland and our interests around the world. Let, let me just ask you, what, what should we do now? Is there anything we can do now? Well, I think that uh, I'd be open-minded to providing assistance to the Iraqi government in terms of uh, training and equipment to allow them to deal with some of these challenges. I would not underestimate the impact that these rebel uh, al-Qaeda-linked forces in Iraq, I'm sorry, in Syria, are now having cross-border in Iraq. I think that's going to be a growing factor. Some have asked me this week if I would support uh, another invasion of Iraq. Of course not. I don't think that's a solution at this point. But I think we're going to be dealing with this for some time. But ultimately, the only way to solve this problem is for the Iraqi government to be able to solve it. They need the military and security resources in the short term. But in the long term, they need a stable political process. Otherwise, this is going to be an ongoing problem forever. All right. Well, Senator, we want to thank you for uh, sharing all this with us today. And when you do make that decision about whether you're going to uh, run for uh, the Republican nomination, I'm sure nomination, you'll hear about it. Yeah. We hope you'll come here and, uh, and tell us about it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me.